Natural selection is the only mechanism by which adaptation can occur. Natural selection involves natural forces acting on species to select for those variations which are beneficial, while selecting against those variations which are harmful to a species. Over time, with enough selection pressure placed on a species, they will not only adapt to their environment, but could change so drastically from other members of their own species that they may evolve to become a new species. In this video, we'll talk about how natural selection acts to shape species, causing them to adapt to their environment and possibly become new species over enough time and with enough change. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Charles Darwin correctly identified natural selection as the primary mechanism by which most, if not all, evolutionary change occurs. However, in On the Origin of Species, Charles Darwin introduces readers to the topic of natural selection by first reminding them of something with which they were all familiar, artificial selection. Artificial selection is the process by which the human eye has shaped species over the last few thousand years. We've been doing it for almost 15,000 years, shaping species to fit our own ends. Whether it's the wild mustard plant that has been bred in several different ways to create crops such as Brussels sprouts, or broccoli, or kohlrabi, or cauliflower. Or whether it's the wild wheat plant that has gone through several different derivations to increase both its hardiness and its output. We've even shaped our own best friends. The domesticated dog is the result of thousands of years of human breeding to breed for things like friendliness, or skilled as a, being skilled as a hunter, or being useful as a shepherd. We've even shaped livestock, such as cattle, to breed them so that they produce more meat per, per pound weight, or consume less water, or are hardier as a species, so they can survive in more harsh environments. We've also famously bred flower species to make them smell different, to appear more beautiful. Just look at the wild variety of roses that you can choose from at any florist. And just a word of caution, be careful what color roses you buy people. It turns out that all those different roses have different meanings and you may accidentally be sending the wrong message. I learned that once in my life, but I'll save that story for a different day. What artificial selection taught Charles Darwin, what it should teach all of us, is that species are phenotypically plastic. What that means is species can change over time. And in fact, if we look at everything that we've just observed, all of these different breeds of roses, all these different breeds of dogs, the different types of cattle that we see, the different types of produce that we've seen, these have all been shaped by man in just the last 15,000 years or so. And in the grand scheme of things, 15,000 years just isn't that long. Consider the fact that Earth has been around for about 4.6 billion years, and life has been around for about 3.7 billion years of that. If humans can make this much change, in these species in just 15,000 years, imagine what the forces of nature acting on species can do in 3.6 billion years. And now you understand how powerful natural selection can be, and also, hopefully, just like Darwin's readers did, understand how natural selection can shape species to the extent that it does. Natural selection is the only mechanism we know that can lead to adaptation. Remember that natural selection works on the natural variation that we find in all species. All species within their gene pool have subtle variations that make certain individuals better adapted for their environment and certain individuals less well adapted. Natural selection selects for those variations which will help a species both survive and reproduce in higher numbers. But why would there need to be any survival in the first place? Well, remember that all species are able to over reproduce. That is, they're able to produce more offspring than their environment can support. So within any species, there is competition for the limited natural resources that exist. Those that have better variations are more likely to acquire that food and survive longer. And if they survive longer, if they're able to be healthier, they will attract more mates and likely reproduce in higher numbers, passing their beneficial variations on to the next generation. There's also competition with other species, whether it's for the same limited resources or competition for survival. For example, Almost all species have a natural predator that's hunting them as a food source. If you're better camouflaged, maybe you're faster, whatever it happens to be, 
that better allows you to survive and avoid being predated, that's also something that could conceivably be considered a beneficial variation. When we talk about things like food availability, predator avoidance, or competition for mates, what we're really talking about are selection pressures. Selection pressures are really anything that help to shape a species. They act on certain aspects of an organism's phenotype. And those, and through these selection pressures, natural selection acts to select for those variations that make organisms better adapted, that is, better able to withstand those selection pressures. When we talk about the ability of an individual to survive and reproduce in higher numbers, what we're actually talking about is a technical term called reproductive fitness. When we talk about the reproductive fitness of an individual, we're referring very specifically to two aspects of its lifestyle. First, it has to be better adapted for survival. It needs to be able to survive long enough that it can do the second part of reproductive fitness, which is reproduce. In order for an organism to be, or an individual, to be reproductively fit, when we measure an individual's reproductive fitness, we're referring to its ability to both survive and to reproduce in higher numbers. And evolution requires both. Because remember, evolution requires that not only do you have beneficial traits, but you're able to pass those beneficial traits on to the next generation. So you need both survival and reproduction. One thing to note about reproductive fitness is what we're really concerned with in terms of evolutionary biology is relative fitness. What we mean by that is there is no such thing as absolute fitness. That kind of goes to the model of bigger, faster, stronger. Being bigger, faster, stronger isn't always best. In fact, in terms of relative fitness, what's good today might actually not be good tomorrow. Because reproductive fitness is really tied to not only your genetic composition, but also the environment. And as we know, the environment is constantly changing. And if the environment changes in such a way that is what is good to what was good today is no longer good, all of a sudden what constitutes a beneficial variation may now constitute a harmful variation. And what formerly constituted a harmful variation may now become a beneficial variation. More than likely, and as far as we know, most variations are actually referred to as being evolutionarily neutral. That is, they in no way benefit, nor do they harm the individual that possesses those traits. A great example in human beings is eye color. There really is no benefit to having any eye color in being humans. This is an evolutionarily neutral trait at this point. Now, is it possible at some point in the future that conditions might change where one eye color is favored over the other? Absolutely. And at that point, all of a sudden, that will become important to our relative fitness. But it's very important when we talk about reproductive fitness that we always keep in mind that reproductive fitness is relative. It's a function of both the variations that an individual possesses, but also the environmental conditions in which they live. Now, as I mentioned before, many of the variations that we see in species are evolutionarily neutral. In other words, they don't benefit or harm the individual. This really is a function of the fact that not every aspect of an individual's phenotype is under selection pressure. Now, I want to return to something that first began with Lamarckian evolution, but is now taken over by Darwinian evolution. If you remember, Lamarck was really focused on his use and disuse theory. The concept that things that were being used heavily tended to improve over time. Now, Lamarck incorrectly ascribed this to the inheritance of acquired traits, remember the giraffe stretching its neck over and over again until the next generation has a slightly longer neck. We now know that doesn't work. Now, Darwin didn't dispose of use and disuse because he rightly saw that things that were important for an organism's survival seemed to continuously improve or at least didn't get worse while as things that didn't seem to be important to an organism's survival were able to change wildly over time. Instead, Darwinian evolution replaces use and disuse with the explanation of things that are used are under selection pressure. And as a result of being under selection pressure, they are constantly undergoing a process of selection. They are being, being assessed essentially through natural selection for whether the, the variations in that particular part of the phenotype are beneficial or harmful or have no effect at all. But if we look at certain traits that aren't under selection pressure, we can actually begin to understand why those disused traits might start to degrade over time or get worse. 
So let's think about it this way. Living things are complex. They're highly ordered and they're very complex pieces of natural machinery, essentially. And what we can do is we can sort of use an analogy for any other very complex piece of equipment, like a computer or a microwave. Now let's say that we go into a computer and we make a few random changes. Now remember, mutations, which are the engine of evolution, are completely random. Mutations happen during errors of DNA replication or exposures to certain chemical mutagens. Bottom line is there's no control over which changes happen within a living thing that cause different variations to occur. So if we go into something very complex like a computer and change something at random, what are the odds that it's going to improve that organism or that computer in this case? Not good. Now, there's a pretty decent chance that there's not going to be any change at all. The computer doesn't work any worse or it doesn't work any better. But let's say that we go in and we randomly make a change within a complex piece of machinery that is going to have an effect. What's most likely going to happen if we smash a computer with a hammer? Chances are it's not going to start working better. It's going to start working worse. And that's the case for living systems as well. Richard Dawkins says it this way. There are more ways to get worse than there are to get better. So over time, if you have a, a trait that isn't under any selection pressure, in other words, no matter what happens to that particular trait, it's not going to enhance an individual's ability to survive and reproduce in any measurable way. And over time, you will naturally acquire mutations because they just happen randomly. What's most likely to happen as a result of the, those mutations? Well, over time, those traits will actually start to degrade. It's not intentional. It's just simply that if you're going to acquire random mutations in a particular aspect of your phenotype, the most likely outcome is that complex trait is going to get worse than it was before. Now, you may think, why doesn't it at least stay the same? Well, there's no selection pressure weeding out those variations in that unpressured trait to help cause it to stay strong. Now, what could happen in, in the long term? Well, remember, environmental conditions can change. And all of a sudden, that trait, which could have been useful under new conditions, has degraded through evolutionary time. Can we magically go back and turn it back on? No, we can't. Sometimes that's what happens. Let me give you a few examples. First, let's start by examining cave species. Cave species are species of amphibians or fish or even uh, or, or arthropods that live in caves. Now remember, deep within these caves, there's no natural sunlight. And the only light these organisms may ever encounter is if a human being wanders down there with a flashlight. They live in perpetual darkness. But one of the recurring things we see with almost all cave species is a degradation of traits that would help only in a lighted world. For example, they all, almost all display a lack of pigment. They're either completely white or even transparent in some cases. They also seem to lack eyes. So why might this be the case? Now, you may argue that, well, that's where they've always existed, so they never had eyes to begin with. Not true. You can actually see, in, for example, with cave salamanders, you can actually see a hole where the eyeball used to be, but it's now just skin. You can even see eye stalks on certain arthropods that the eyes are supposed to be the end of, the stalks are there, there are just no eyes. It's clear that these species are descendant from non-cave-dwelling species, so they retain the majority of the features that are present in their non-cave-dwelling ancestors. But what happened? Well, it's simple. All of a sudden, they left an environment where there was intense selection pressure to have pigment, to be camouflaged to be able to see, to avoid predators and catch your prey, to an environment where there is no light. Eyes are no longer useful. In fact, they may actually be harmful to you. Same thing with pigment. It takes energy to produce the proteins needed to be pigmented. And when there's no selection pressure to maintain good eyesight, no selection pressure to maintain pigmentation, over time, mutations will be acquired in those genes. And there'll be no penalty for those mutations to be harmful. And over time, because there are more ways to get worse than there are to get better, those particular aspects of the organism's phenotype gradually become non-existent. If you look inside of them, you'll find the genes for making eyes. You'll find the genes for making pigment. But they're just heavily mutated to the point where they're no longer functional. 
They were allowed to mutate in this way because simply there was no selection pressure on them to have eyes. In fact, there may be a benefit to being completely blind as a cave dwelling species. The eyes actually represent a weak spot on the body. They can actually represent a spot where, where, where an attack could actually damage the internal organs, namely the brain, which is contained within the skull. Losing eyes may actually be beneficial and it makes them actually more resistant to damage when they enter into a conflict. So there may have actually been positive selection pressure at a certain point to, for them to actually lose those particular structures. Another great example comes from the consistently found flightless birds that we find on islands. In order to understand this, first we have to recognize that there are literally tens of thousands of islands on the planet Earth. Now, we'll talk about this in another video when we get into biogeography, particularly island biogeography. There are two major types of land on the planet Earth. There are what are called continental islands and there are oceanic islands. Let's start with one of the tens of thousands of oceanic islands on the planet Earth. Many of these islands have species of birds, but what they lack are species of terrestrial mammals and, for the most part, terrestrial reptiles. We'll talk about more about the reasons for that in a different video. But they almost all contain at least some species of bird, and in many cases, these birds have lost the ability to fly. Now, of course, we know that these are descendants of bird species that at one point could fly, otherwise they wouldn't have been able to get to these islands in the first place. But over time, we start to see in many of these species that the, the wings become, uh, they become stunted, they become smaller. These birds lose the ability to fly. They often gain weight and become much fatter than their, their cousins. Why might this be the case? Well, let's talk about the pros and cons of flight. The evolutionary advantage to flight is that you're able to fly. And I know that seems kind of trivial to say it that way, but it's true. Being able to fly is a huge advantage. You can cover massive distances in a very short period of time. That's why the birds were able to get to the island in the first place and mammals weren't. It also allows you to avoid predation. If you can fly away from the thing that's hunting you, that's a great advantage. It also allows you to find your prey or to find your food much more easily. There's a reason why we refer to people with good eyesight as having eagle eye or hawk eye. They have tremendous eyesight that allows them to spot prey from hundreds of feet in the air, dive down and target them. But when you move as a species to a tiny island in the middle of the ocean, none of those advantages matter anymore. First off, it's a small island. Where are you flying to? So covering great distances, no longer an advantage. You don't have any of your natural predators there. There are no land mammals that would hunt you, no land reptiles that might hunt you. Essentially, you're safe on the ground, so there's no defensive advantage. And food is plentiful. There's not a lot there to compete with you for things like seeds and, and insects and other things that you might eat. So you don't need to fly hundreds of feet in the air to spot your prey while avoiding your predators. It's a pretty good gig. But more importantly, because there's not, none of these things are beneficial, there's no longer a selection pressure to maintain the ability to fly. And just like we saw with the cave species, there might actually be pros to losing flight. There might be evolutionary advantages. There might be selection pressures for the loss of flight. First off, flight is very energetically expensive. It costs a lot of energy for a bird to fly. That's why if you watch most large birds, they're not flapping their wings much. They're riding thermals. It's a conserve energy because the physical muscle use to power flight is very energetically costly. It requires them to eat more. Secondly, wings are a weak spot, just like we saw with eyes. If you damage a bird's wings, you could damage it in such a way that that bird won't survive. It can't get around much, and it will likely die, possibly from internal injuries. So reducing the size of the wings might actually, again, help them increase their damage resistance. But the other thing is wings are cumbersome. They're not really easy to move around with. By reducing the size of the wings, it might actually make them much more efficient at walking on the ground and hunting their food, where their food is going to be located. Again, we see that sort of trade-off of first, there's no selection pressure. There are more ways to get worse than there are to get better. Gradually, those, actually, those traits like wings are going to decrease in functionality. Then you might also have a positive selection pressure to cause the reduction of those wing sizes because there's actually reproductive advantages 
to having reduced wing sizes if there's no longer a slip reflection pressure in favor of flight. Now, as you can see from the examples that we just described, natural selection is an important and potent way in which species are able to change over time. Whether it's the action of selection pressures shaping species or the absence of selection pressures, both of these can have an effect on the way a species evolves. We've talked about how the absence of selection pressures can shape species, essentially by just sort of letting traits kind of degrade over time. Now let's talk about how selection pressures act to shape species. We're going to talk about the modes of selection. And there are three different types of selection that we commonly find. We'll go through them one by one. The thing I want you to picture when we describe these modes of selection is I want you to picture all of the traits that we're discussing occurring sort of over a wide spectrum. And there would be a bell shaped curve, as you can see here, that describes the number of the members of the population that have this particular trait with respect to where they are on the spectrum. You can see it's a bell shaped curve with the majority of them kind of having this sort of middle phenotype. And then as you move out toward the outer edges of the bell, fewer and fewer individuals have that particular size trait or color trait or whatever it happens to be. And then we're going to describe how natural selection can act to shape that population by altering the way that particular phenotypic curve looks. Let's start first with diversifying selection, also known as disruptive selection. To picture how natural forces are acting, how selection pressures are acting during diversifying selection, I want you to picture yourself taking your finger and pushing down in the middle of that bell-shaped curve. Push it so the middle goes straight down to the bottom and equal parts go out to either side, either phenotypic extreme. Diversifying or disruptive selection occurs when either phenotypic extreme is favored over an intermediate phenotype. So let's give some examples of where this may occur. The Alabama beach mouse is a mouse, pop, is a mouse species that lives um, in two different major environments. Field environments, which are high grasses and, and, sh and scrub brush, and beaches. When we look at the Alabama beach mouse population, we find two different groups. We find very dark brown colored Alabama beach mice, and we find very light colored Alabama beach mice. What we don't see is sort of a mid brown colored beach mouse. In other words, again, we have both phenotypic extremes, dark brown and light brown, but no like brown brown or medium brown. Why might this be the case? Well, looking at where you find these individuals will give you a clue. Dark brown Alabama beach mice are found in the grassy environments. They're found in the fields, whereas the light brown Alabama field mice are found on the beaches mainly. And the reason why is that's where they're best adapted. It's very hard to see the dark brown mice in the fields, but the light brown mice would stand out and be very easy targets for predators. Vice versa, you would see if you put the dark brown mice on the beach alongside the light brown mice. Dark brown mice would stick out against the light colored beach sand and would be easy marks for predators. But if you're a mid brown mouse, you have neither advantage. You stick out more than the dark brown mi mice in the field and you stick out more than the light brown mice on the beach. There's no good home for you. And as a result, they're less reproductively fit. And over time, you end up with a split in the population. Light brown Alabama beach mice and dark brown Alabama beach mice, each living in their own respective environment. So you can see again, predation here then becomes the selection pressure that's shaped the coat color of these of this particular species. Again, you see disruptive or diversifying selection. Either extreme is favored, while the intermediate phenotype is disfavored by this particular selection pressure. The next mode of selection we'll talk about is called directional selection. Picture our nice bell-shaped phenotypic curve sitting right here on this particular graph, and take your finger and then push the whole curve either right or left. Push it towards one phenotypic extreme, and you have directional selection. Directional selection favors one phenotypic extreme over another or an intermediate phenotype. And there are lots of great examples of this. We'll talk about two in this particular video. The classic example is the peppered moth. The peppered moth is so named because the traditional coloration pattern of this moth is a white moth with black spots on it. 
And this particular coloration pattern provided perfect camouflage when this moth would come to rest on the birch trees or the willow trees or the oak trees in the forests surrounding the cities. There was also this weird sort of uh, obscure variant of the pepper moth that was just all black in color. However, that particular version, that particular phenotype was heavily disfavored because these black colored moths were unable to blend in on the birch trees or the oak trees or the willow trees when they came to rest and they were much easier to spot by predators. And they tended to be a very minority member of the population. However, a strange thing happened in the mid-1800s. These large cities began burning these carboniferous rocks in order to power their cities, their manufacturing plants, and keep lights on. And it was these coal-burning power plants and stoves that began to fill the atmosphere with coal soot. And this coal soot would go up in the air and it would land in the forests outside of these industrialized cities. And it would actually stain the trunks of trees black. And as a result, when the traditionally colored pepper coloration of the moth, when they would land on these trees, all of a sudden, these moths stood out. Because the white coloration would stand out from the, black, the, the sooty black trunks of these trees. But here comes the black variant. That dark black, solid black colored variant of the moth, all of a sudden, was now beneficial. What was formerly the minority of the population now rapidly became the majority because those expressing the peppered variant were much more easy to pick off by predators, whereas those that had the darker variant blended in much better with their environment. Here again, we see predation acting as a selection pressure. But then something wonderful happened. Well, maybe not for that particular version of the pepper moth, but wonderful for humans. We stopped burning coal, or at least we reduced our coal burning. And we started turning to cleaner sources of energy. Eventually, coal soot stopped falling from the sky, and those tree trunks became unstained. And now what do we see? We see a shift back in the other direction, towards the traditional peppered coloration of the moth, now disfavoring that darker, solid black variant of the species. What you see is actually directional selection occurring in both directions. First, a directional selection towards one phenotypic extreme, the all-black version of the moth. Then, shifting back the other way to the peppered variant of the moth at the other end of the phenotypic spectrum. This is a classic example of directional selection. Another cool example from the fossil record is the evolution of whales. So the evolution of whales took place over somewhere between 50 and 60 million years. And what you may not know is 50 to 60 million years ago, the ancient ancestor of all whales was sort of like a dog-like aquatic species that lived in like swamps or shallow rivers, it had four legs, did all the things that a, a terrestrial species would do. And if you look at where its nostrils are located, it's where you'd expect them to be at the end of the nose, at the front of the head. But over time, in fact, within 10 million years, the lineage of whales evolved to almost an entirely aquatic lifestyle. And as you can see, it began acquiring a, a appendages that heavily favored an aquatic lifestyle. And so you see the body plan of the modern day whale appear uh, of just a few million years ago. But what you may not have noticed if you didn't examine the skulls of these individuals is something was happening to the nostrils, to the nasal openings. If you look at this collection of fossils, you can see that the nasal openings have moved gradually over the last 50 million years from the tip of the nose to the middle of the forehead. And if you think about modern day cetaceans, whales, dolphins, porpoises, uh, orcas, they don't have nostrils. They don't have a nose. I mean, what are they sniffing anyways, right? What do they have? They have blowholes. Blowholes are their nostrils. They are the openings that used to serve as an entrance to the nasal cavities have now been migrated to the top of the head. This, again, is a form of directional selection from one phenotypic extreme to the next. There's a constant movement over the past 50 or 60 million years from these openings at the end of the nose up along the forehead and finally to the top of the head and fusing together as a single nostril that we now know as the blowhole, directional selection. The last form of selection that we'll talk about is stabilizing selection. Instead of pushing your bell-shaped curve in one direction or smushing it down the middle, I want you to take your fingers and I want you to pinch it. Pinch the bases so that all of those little outliers on the side squeeze into the middle and the middle of the bell curve rises up. So now you have a narrow shaped bell curve. Stabilizing selection greatly favors the intermediate phenotype either over either phenotypic extreme. One really interesting study in stabilizing selection actually comes from human beings. 
When we look at the birth weight of human beings, we see a classic example of stabilizing selection that is in direct response to two different phenotypes undergoing directional selection. So it's kind of a cool comparison of different types of selection acting on a single species all at the same time with different results. During the 7 million year evolution of human beings, we began to walk more bipedally. Being bipedal required some anatomical changes. One of them was the narrowing of the pelvis. Wide pelvises make it hard to, to articulate the legs forward. So a narrow pelvis made it easier for us to not only get our butts under us, but to point our legs in the right direction. So as the, at the same time as the pelvis is narrowing, also narrowing the birth canal through which babies must pass, our craniums were also undergoing directional selection and getting larger. This was, to, in, this was to accommodate our increased brain size, our ability to do things like rational thought. So not only do you have the, pel the pelvic opening narrowing, but you also have the cranium getting larger. So we have a larger baby to fit through a smaller opening. So what happened? Well, over time, these two forces worked together to actually lead to the stabilizing selection of human birth weight. See, for almost all of human existence, the average birth weight was right around six and a half to seven pounds. The reason for this is simple. If a baby was much bigger than that, it was very hard for natural childbirth to occur. The baby would get stuck and both the baby and the mom would die. If the baby was too small, it was likely the result of that child being malnourished. And even if the baby was born, it wasn't likely to survive. So up until about the last 50 years or so, human birth weight has been under a stabilizing selection to be right around six and a half to seven pounds. Why has that changed recently? Well, the advent of, of modern birthing techniques, the ability to do things like cesarean sections and having both mom and baby survive have made it now much more common to have babies that are significantly larger. Also, our understanding of prenatal care has led to babies of larger birth size. This isn't a bad thing. We just need, we just need to be able to accommodate for it with modern medicine. Another classic example of stabilizing selection comes from gall flies. So gall flies are this species of fly and they actually lay their eggs inside the stems of golden rods. Um, and then over time, these eggs will hatch and the larvae begin to eat the inside of the stems. They form something called a gall. Now the plant responds to produce this gall by basically reinforcing it with sort of plant like scar tissue. So as the larvae is eating the plant stem for food, the, the golden rod begins producing more and more tissue um, to replace that which is lost and it leads to the formation of this fibrous structure called a gall. Now galls range in size from small to large but this is stabilizing selection that we're talking about and it turns out that sort of the Goldilocks principle applies here. Gall fly larvae do not want to make a gall, uh, a gall that is too large. They don't want to eat too much and cause the plant to cause a gall that's to create a gall that's too large and the reason why is hummingbirds will actually come along peck into the gall and then eat the larvae. However, if the gall is too small, the larvae inside become a target for what are called parasitoid wasps. Parasitoid wasps will actually uh, break through the gall and then inject the larvae with their own eggs. And the eggs will hatch and the larvae of the parasitoid wasp will kind of do to the larvae what the larvae did to the goldenrod. It's kind of a horrific thing if you're the larvae. But the bottom line is this. Because of predation, either for hummingbirds or parasitoid wasps, the best size for a gall shape, a gall, a gall fly larvae to produce for their gall is sort of right in the middle. It's too big for the parasitoid wasp to be able to break into and infect them with their larvae. It's also too small for it to be worth the bird's time to come peg its way through to get the very small, the, the, the small larvae inside. Sort of the Goldilocks principle. And that's stabilizing selection. Another great example of stabilizing selection actually comes in the form of sexual selection. And we'll talk about sexual selection in another video. But one of the things I want to point out is that quite often sexual selection is a form of stabilizing selection as well, as we'll see. We'll talk about that more in a future video, so stay tuned. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today we talked about natural selection and how it acts to shape species over time through the use of selection pressures. Selection pressures are very powerful forces that are able to shape species leading to adaptation and eventually, if enough change occurs over time, speciation events. That'll be a topic for another video coming up shortly. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope you learned a lot, and I hope to see you again in another one of my videos. Thanks. Bye.